This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. Today I want to answer the question, who sets the price of Bitcoin? I've been getting a bunch of questions that are related, so I thought I'd answer them all today. First one here, please explain the mechanics of how the price of Bitcoin is determined. I understand supply and demand is the driver, but exactly how is the price determined? Is there a centralized organization that publishes the price? Does the individual exchange determine the price? If not, how is it determined? Not being a skeptic, just trying to wrap my head around how a decentralized monetary system can have a single price at any given moment without a, without a centralized organization involved somehow. And then a related question, maybe speak about the use of OTC desks to hold down prices. I'll start with the second question first. OTC stands for over the counter. These are trading desks that help to match up orders from large buyers and sellers. And back in my old hedge fund days, I often spoke with these desks at the big banks, at our prime broker and elsewhere to buy or sell large blocks of stock, foreign currency, or derivatives like fixed income swaps, for example. It's quite a rush, I have to say, to pick up the phone and instantly buy $5 billion worth of yen or treasuries or something like that. Now, these OTC desks make money by taking a small spread or a percentage of the trade that they then embed in the price that they offer you. This is at least how it worked when I was doing it. And here's why OTC desks cannot manipulate the global price of Bitcoin. If the price of Bitcoin on an OTC desk is lower than Coinbase or another exchange, a deep liquid exchange like Coinbase, then all you need to do is you buy Bitcoin from the OTC desk and then you sell it on Coinbase for a profit. You could also buy Bitcoin from an OTC desk and then simultaneously short BTC on an exchange using futures, swaps, perpetual futures, various things like this, and then either cover both legs of the trade or maybe deliver your over-the-counter Bitcoin to cover the short. It really depends on what kind of instruments you're using. Now, the opposite is also true. If the price of Bitcoin on an OTC desk is higher than Coinbase, then you just buy some BTC on Coinbase, you send it over to the OTC desk, and you sell it for a profit. So in practice, this is what happens. This is called arbitrage, and global arbitrage closes these price gaps extremely quickly. It's a basic principle of finance that excess returns above the risk-free rate, which is usually uh, the, t the uh, treasury curve in the US. And of course, it's not really risk-free, but this is what it's called. Any excess returns above these yields are always rapidly arbed away if it's possible to do so, as we can see. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to help out the channel, help to support the channel by becoming a subscriber, click the subscribe button, leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. I really love getting those. And also share this video with a friend or family member. Now this arbitrage of prices across the world is not just confined to Bitcoin, obviously. It's it's used in every single market, whether it's bananas or oil or stock, for example. Here we can see Microsoft trading in Frankfurt at the Frankfurt Exchange, currently trading bid at 389.6, offered at 389.85. And that may look like a different price because in the pre-market here in the US, it's trading at 423, $424 a share. Of course, this is in dollars and this is in euros. And when you do the conversion, you can see that it's trading at approximately the same price. If it weren't, you could buy Microsoft shares in Europe, send them over to the NASDAQ and sell them in the US or vice versa. And this is how arbitrage works. Now, one thing to remember is that price differences do not get arbed away, get arbitraged away if you cannot get access to the market. So for example, let's say a used smartphone costs $200 in Denver, and there's a Russian consumer somewhere in Russia who's willing to pay $250 plus shipping for that same phone. This ARB cannot be exploited though because sanctions prevent sellers, especially if US sellers, from selling to Russian buyers and thereby closing the arbitrage. And so the price gap will exist in places where you cannot ARB the prices. This is the same thing that happens with Cuba, for example, where as this article points out, a Volkswagen, a new Volkswagen, just a small one, might cost $70,000, while a new Peugeot might be something like a quarter of a million dollars. And you cannot exploit this ARB because it's very difficult to bring cars into Cuba. By contrast, Bitcoin, it's very easy to send it around the world. It's easy to send it from one exchange to another using an on-chain transaction, using Lightning, or even using the Liquid Network. And this was one of the 
early interesting uses for liquid Bitcoin. And then what you do is you, you use these various methods for sending the Bitcoin and then locking in buy and sell prices and thus arbing the price globally. For this reason, the price of Bitcoin across regulated global exchanges is always going to be approximately the same when you adjust for the fiat exchange rates. When you price it, if it's in dollars or euros, when you do the comparison, it's always going to be approximately the same. You may see small differences. Of course, there's the bid ask spread. If your exchange is less liquid, the bid ask spread is going to be a little wider. Also, it may just be that the differences, the price differences are so small that they are too small to arb away given the transaction costs, given the commissions or the spreads or the cost of uh, sending on chain or liquid or on lightning. So for example, the price of Bitcoin, the last price on Coinbase might be 71,000. The last price of Bitcoin that traded on Kraken may be 71,010 cents. And it's just because there's no, uh, there's no point in our being this to make 10 cents, even if you lever up the trade. So you can see small differences like this, but prices globally of Bitcoin do converge. KYC Bitcoin always costs about the same everywhere when you make those fiat price adjustments. KYC stands for Know Your Customer. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is whenever you open up a brokerage account or a crypto account or a Bitcoin account, the exchange will almost always these days collect your personal data, like your name, your address, your driver's license, probably a selfie photo as well. However, non-KYC Bitcoin is different. It'll be priced different from KYC Bitcoin. It will almost always cost more. So the price of Bitcoin on Coinbase might be 71,000. The price of non-KYC Bitcoin, more anonymous Bitcoin that you would buy from a P2P exchange, maybe it's $2,000 more, $73,000 per coin. The price of non-KYC Bitcoin when you meet your quote unquote dealer in a dark alley might be $72,000 uh, because it's a little uh, slightly differently priced from where it is on the P2P exchange. You can decide where, whether it's more dangerous to do something online or to meet someone in person. And so the prices can be higher or lower depending on what people think about that. Why does non-KYC Bitcoin cost more? It costs more for the same reason that Facebook and other apps like that are free. Basically, you are the product. Regulated global crypto and Bitcoin exchanges collect your personal information and then sell granular or aggregated forms of it, of this personal information to governments and pretty much anyone else who is willing to pay the high price for it. So the price of non-KYC Bitcoin, I consider it to be the real price. This is the purchase price of self-sovereign money. And then KYC Bitcoin, as you might buy on Coinbase or Binance, for example, is always offered at a discount to this self-sovereign price because you've given up personal information that can then be linked to your Bitcoin withdrawal address and followed on chain. There are ways to mitigate against this. For example, CoinJoin, which I have mentioned briefly on this channel at times. Also, you can just buy anonymous Bitcoin, buy non-KYC Bitcoin to start with. You usually, it's very difficult to accumulate large amounts of this. You have to piece it together, but it can be done. And these are more advanced topics. I don't cover them on this channel. I often allude to them, but I don't cover them on this channel for obvious reasons, which you can guess in the current regulatory environment. I do cover them elsewhere in depth when you're ready for that, when you've exhausted all the free resources on YouTube. I talk about how to buy Bitcoin anonymously in my paid course, as well as how to do CoinJoin with the one remaining tool that is still left to us. So what's the real price of Bitcoin? It's really wherever the buyer and seller meet to exchange their Bitcoin at that point in time and in that place in the world. Bitcoin remains the most free market in the world. It's also the deepest, most liquid free market in the world. Obviously, US dollars and treasuries and various other fiat uh, currencies have larger and deeper markets, but these are highly manipulated markets with uh, ever-increasing supplies. They don't have the scarcity of Bitcoin either. If we take a look at trading volume for Bitcoin and then for crypto, the last 24 hours, Bitcoin has traded 26 billion. Ethereum traded only 14 billion. And then of course, Tether, which is a derivative of the US dollar had higher volume. But when you go down here, you can see that Bitcoin remains the biggest, largest, deepest, most liquid free market in the world. There lit literally is no second best. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.